you believe in the name of Jesus, somebody give him praise. Stand up, you believe in the God of freedom, somebody give him praise. Stand up, you believe in the name of Jesus, somebody give him praise. Stand up, you believe that his word is final, somebody give him praise. Stand up, if you believe in a new revival, somebody give him praise. Stand up, if you believe that the spirit's moving. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Everyone here and on YouTube. I want to make sure I always get YouTube in there. And, and uh, what's the thing here now, Phil? We want them to subscribe, hit like, subscribe, like, and subscribe. Hit notifications and share. Okay, that, just what Phil said there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> anyway, oh, it's it's awesome to be here this morning. Very happy to be here. I am. I hope everyone else is. And just looking forward to praising and worshiping our Lord, our Heavenly Father. And what an awesome privilege and honor that is. So, without ado, let's go ahead and pray and, and start doing that. So, Father God, we just come before you. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. And Lord, help us. Be with us. And we invite you, your Holy Spirit, to be with us here this morning. And move amongst us and do whatever you want to do in and through us and in this time here today with, with worship and as Pastor Todd brings the word. And so we thank you for this and all things in Jesus' name. Amen.
tongue Running to me with your half-truth Don't come crawling me with your lies Cause I've seen the liar and slip through his eye too Pulled out by Jesus Christ You've been pushing a spiritual nothing But now I'm throwing it all away Surely this whole thing has got to mean something Because it does to me It does to me And this is more to me than just some story And this is more to me than just some song In some kind of closet Cause sooner or later He'll knock down the doors You can slander my name if you want it Woo! Welcome to church again Good morning Oh that song BTR, huh? Some big tent revival He says a line in there I'm going to ask you Is this more to you than just some story? Is this thing more to you than just some song that's sang? Is God real? Is He real? Amen. I think He is. I know He is. We're going to get to part in the chapter where Paul's going to make that clear to us, I think. Thank you, praise band. That was an awesome time of praise and worship. Uh, who worshiped in this place this morning? Raise your hand. I did. I couldn't help it. It's not that I was trying not to, but... I didn't have to try very hard to get it to happen. Hard not to, Kenny says. So, all these things I've said to avoid the question that I always ask, that I don't really want to avoid, I want to ask it right up front. Who read their Bibles this week? Raise your hand. Amen. Awesome. Good for you who did. If you, if you didn't read your Bible, and I'm not looking at anyone, <laughs> but I have to tell you, you cheated yourself this week. You just did. And if somebody else would have cheated you that way, you would have called 911. And you'd have, you'd have wanted them arrested and thrown in jail for the way they cheated you, but you did it to yourself. I thought that was kind of fitting since Paul's kind of in jail here in the chapter. So he's been in jail for a while. We are in Acts chapter 25 this week. We're going to continue our journey through the book of Acts till we get all the way to the end of the book of Acts, and we're getting close. Who knows how close we're getting? We're getting, getting, getting pretty close. We're getting pretty close. Uh, last week we were in chapter 24. Paul continued to focus on the resurrection. There's a good reason he continues to focus on that, because it's what it's all about. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is what it's all about. The, the whole canon of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, so last week I said more to the point, and there was a little bit more to the point of the resurrection, that it's not some far off event. Jesus actually said, I am the resurrection. And when you believe on him, you are resurrected right then and there. So it's not something we wait on per se. So you can watch that on YouTube, Get Solid TV is our channel. If you missed any of our sermons, you can always catch them there. Uh, the title of the sermon this week for Acts chapter 25 is Back to the Point. Last week was more to the point. Now we're going to get back to the point. Okay? And I think by the time I'm done reading about Paul's proceedings and this trial, and you might find yourself tired of me saying the word resurrection. <laughs> you know, like, is that all the guy's going to talk about? It's been weeks now, and he's talking about the resurrection. Could he move on to something else? And, and I understand, maybe. Maybe that could be tiring, but know this. Know this for a fact. If you're a Christian, you should never tire of the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. 
That shouldn't be something you ever get tired of hearing. He resurrected from the dead. That cross, we have a cross sitting over here in the sanctuary. That cross is empty for a reason. He's not there. He's raised again. Okay, he's alive to live forevermore. So today we are back to the point. And the point is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the point. And that's also what we call the gospel. Amen. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that can be applied to you. Amen. So let's pray and get right here to chapter 25. Bow your heads if you would. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a time and place to gather, to worship as we have, to fellowship with each other, to help one another grow in the faith, Father. And right now we thank you for a time to study your word, to open your word, to read your word, anoint my lips to preach your message. Give us all ears to hear it with and a heart to receive it with. In Jesus' name, amen. So... When we do start reading in, in 25, we'll be in chapter 13, or verse 13. But real quick, just so we keep along the storyline here, since where we were at in chapter 24, two years have passed. It's not, you know, like minute by minute, this book of Acts. There's some time that passes. Two years have passed. Valuable time, no doubt, to the author of this book, Luke. It is believed that he was compiling everything he needed to write his gospel during these two years, uh, possibly even doing personal interviews with the mother of Christ. That's some speculation, not in the Bible, but things to think about. So two years have passed. Uh, Felix, if we remember from chapter 24, who was the governor that uh, had Paul uh, testify, he's been replaced by a new governor, and his name's Festus. Apparently they like guys with the name F, starting their name Felix and Festus. Uh, so Festus is now right here in chapter 25 has come on as the new governor and of course the first thing the high priests and the council try to do is to get Paul released to them they're like hey there's this guy locked up his name's Paul and he's really supposed to be our prisoner why don't you go ahead and let him go to us what do you suppose they wanted to do with Paul they wanted to kill him that's right. And they said, well, at least, if nothing else, bring him back from Caesarea to Jerusalem and uh, so we can, you know, have a trial here. And it even said in the chapter they planned to kill him before he ever got there. So much for a trial in Jerusalem. They were going to lay weight on the way. And uh, it seems that they possibly even let Festus in on this little scheme uh, when, to kill him when he was transferred. And Festus is like, no. Now, if a Roman deserves to be tried with their accusers face to face, which has already happened here, and they've already found pretty much Paul innocent, but we got the new guy on the scene and we're going to do it again. Okay? But these, uh, these high priests and the council members who were planning to kill Paul, what do you think about that? Real nice guys, huh? What do you think? We'll just kill him on the way. Those, those are some nice guys. I like to have some guys like that as friends, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ever wonder why religion gets a bad name? It's guys like this. <laughs> they don't care if Paul's innocent or not. They just want to kill him. Uh, uh, there's people like this that make you wonder, right? People who claim to be religious but yet would claim to do injustice upon another human. It just doesn't seem right to me. And it doesn't seem right to God. But we're going to start reading now that we have this in our minds. Two years have passed. Festus is there. Festus has actually uh, had the hearing, and he's pretty much found nothing wrong. But we're going to take off in 13, because he kind of retells the story a little bit to uh, King Agrippa. So verse 13, chapter 25. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. So they come to say, you know, you're the governor now, and, we, and I'm the king, and we're all going to get along and enjoy political supremacy, basically, right? 
So enter King Agrippa. He, his name was Herod Agrippa II. He is the son of King Herod from chapter 12, uh, where you might remember that he killed James of the Christian church, and he imprisoned Peter. This, this is that King Agrippa's son. And this guy really thought he was something. He, he really shouldn't have had the title king. By this time, there should have been a governor or something else, but he preferred the title king. And uh, we, we have actually found coins, Roman coins, with his image and an inscription on them that he actually preferred this title, the great king. So that's who this guy, this King Agrippa, he's the, the great king, right? Make a coin of me with my beautiful face on it and put the great king. I mean, think about the <laughs> what you think of yourself if you... Okay, so that's who he is. Keep that in mind. Uh, the great king. Verse 14, we'll read on. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's case unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix. I'll tell King Agrippa about all this. 15, about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. Yeah, they wanted to kill him. 16, to whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. So he knew it was an injustice. So this guy, Festus, wasn't all bad. Amen. 17, therefore, when they were come hither, without any delay on the morrow. So as soon as he said, come, they came. They're hot, on, hot to trot after Paul. They're not delaying. They're not waiting. I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. In verse 18, against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I suppose. Okay, so what do you think he supposed? Well, he supposed Paul was guilty, like everyone else has supposed. These guys are so mad, they want to kill him. He must have done something terrible. He's guilty, right? If you're following the story. He supposed he was guilty, but he was not. He says he didn't do any of the things I had supposed. Basically saying he's innocent, so read on, 19. But had certain questions against him of their own own superstition, derogatory word for religion, and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. So here we are back to the point. We're back to the point. This is the verse that just takes us right back to the point. The resurrection, specifically the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Festus could see it was clearly the point. Verse 20, and because I doubted of such manner of questions, he didn't know. Festus wasn't a Jew. He didn't know any of these things they were talking about. I asked him whether he would, be, he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. Now, he knows what they're planning. So then he just wants to rid himself of this trouble. He just come in office. I got this... The guy before me left this undone thing, and these people that I rule over are all mad. They'll take care of the problem if I just send him to Jerusalem. They'll kill him along the way, and none of us will ever have to worry about this anymore. So he asked Paul to sign his own death warrant. Will you go to Jerusalem then and just, I don't know anything about Jews and Jewish customs. Can you just go to Jerusalem and be judged? Will you just go die? I mean, think about how the storyline here goes. <sighs> uh, where are we at? 21? But when Paul had appealed, so he asked him if he'd go to Jerusalem. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, that's the emperor of Rome, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. So now he can't go anywhere, but he's a Roman citizen and he has demanded his appeal all the way to the highest court because he's innocent, right? 
And so now Festus, he wants to send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa, King Agrippa, right, the great king, said unto Festus, I would also hear this man myself. I'll check into this. I'm, I'm the great king. I might be able to solve this problem for you. And so Festus immediately says to him there at the end of verse 22, Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. We're just take care of this right now, you know. So, so tomorrow, the words of the Lord Jesus from chapter 9, verse 15, if you remember what happened there, it's when Paul was struck down and, and he was giving instructions, they'll come to pass tomorrow in the story, right? This is what Jesus said. He said, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, talking about Paul, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And tomorrow, Paul's going to do just that. There's going to be Gentiles there. That's Festus and all the other Romans. There's going to be the children of Israel there, the chief priests and the rulers of Israel, and King Agrippa going to be there. It's all going to come true tomorrow in the story. Don't read your chapter. Don't skip your chapter next week. What will happen when King Agrippa, you know, we got, I'm trying to build the days of our lives, right? I mean, so it, it, it's going to be cool. It's going to happen. Prophecy fulfilled. The Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke these words. It's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, one quick point to make about that. Every word the Lord speaks will come to pass. Every single time. Every place in your Bible, if you read something God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Every time. This is playing out in the same book. So in Acts chapter 9, God said it. Acts chapter 26, it's going to happen. That quick, right? It doesn't matter if it's 100 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, 6,000 years. God says it. It's going to come to pass every single time. Even if it seems impossible. Even if you say there's no way. There's just no way. People for years said there's no way there will ever be a country of Israel again. When there was never a country of Israel for years and years and years. And Bible prophecy said there would be. And people just said, no, it's never going to happen. Never gonna. And then, lo and behold, World War II, 1948, guess what? There's a country of Israel, Israel right now. You know where the American embassy is in Israel now? Jerusalem. Okay. God says it's going to happen. It's going to happen, folks. And that, that really seemed impossible. I mean, people in the 40s said there is never, ever going to be a country named Israel again. That was impossible. Go look at a current world map. It's possible. All things are possible with God. Amen. The trouble with the worldly mindset is somehow we think we can make up our own rules. Did you know that? All of us. Even Christians, we somehow think we can make up our own rules. Eh, I'll do that. It's not so bad. And God said, don't do that. <laughs> but we make up our own rules, right? That's the worldly mindset, by the way. And uh, if God says it's going to happen, and someone might say, how do you know what God says, Pastor? Does anyone know how to know what God says? Read your Bible. Why does the pastor get up here and say, who read their Bibles this week? Because I know if you did, you'll know what God said. <laughs> who read their Bibles? Those are the people who knows what God, know what God said. Okay, so back to the point. That was the, the title. Back to the point, which in verse 19, we got right back to the point here. So I found it very interesting that even the pagan, the Roman with no knowledge of Jewish scriptures or Jewish history, could see the point, clearly. Festus, he saw it. So look back at 19 and see what it says. This is Festus talking. But this was the accusations brought against Paul. He said, nothing I supposed, nothing that was illegal. 
He said, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, their own religion, which he didn't believe in, so he called it a superstition, and of one Jesus, which was dead, this man is dead, he says, which Paul says is alive. He doesn't really care probably too much about that. So to the non-believer, Jesus is just a dead guy. You run into non-believers, you know what they think about the Lord Jesus Christ? Just a dead guy. If they believe he even existed at all. But, you know, it's pretty hard to say he didn't exist. History's pretty clear on most of it. It's that you really got to bury your head in the sand to say there was never a guy named Jesus. Okay. But then when you, if you get to the point where, okay, he lived, but he's just a dead guy now. That's what they think of him. Okay. But Paul was saying that Jesus was alive to the guy that thought he was just a dead guy. So that's the very heart of the gospel. And that is that we don't worship a dead man. Jesus Christ is not dead. That's not who we worship. He's not dead and he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living, those who are alive in Christ. Amen? Jesus is alive. So turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because Paul has something to say. Same Paul we're, we've been talking about here in Acts. Chapter 15, we're going to read starting in verse 13. He's going to talk a little bit about the resurrection. I said you might get tired of that, but Paul doesn't tire of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13. But, this is Paul speaking, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not, if so be, that the dead not rise not. 16. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain? Ye are yet in your sins? Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, like nothing after this life, right? If in this life only we are of all men most miserable. <laughs> he says it's a miserable existence to not believe that there's life after death. Miserable. And without the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no life after death. So we're, we're the most miserable, he says. Right? Read on. 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die... Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. Hallelujah. All those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't seem to tire of speaking of the resurrection. Paul says the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if it's not historically true, if it's not an actual event, if it didn't actually take place, then we're just wasting our time. It's just a waste of time to be a Christian if it did not actually happen. Spinning your wheels, wasting your time, go home, get drunk, you know, do whatever you got to do, because tomorrow you all die and it's the end anyway. Right? Isn't that what he basically... Just wasting your time. But, he said, it is true. There at the end of that statement, he said, but Christ is true risen and it's changed the world the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has completely changed the world this world is a certain way because of that
okay? Even our calendar, okay? But what's more important than that? It has changed me. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has changed me. I don't have to have the world prove anything to me. I know I'm not the same as I was before I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What about you? Has it changed you? So you know it's true. That's how you know it's true. If it's changed you. I hope, I pray that it's changed you. Even the people watching on YouTube, I pray you've experienced that. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, you're dead. I said it last week, and Paul said it again. Death came by Adam. You're dead. You're dead right now in sin, and you're separated from God right now, and you will perish without Jesus Christ. You will perish. So I already told you that every word God speaks will come to pass. I said that was true. You knew. I hope you believe that's true. And Jesus himself said these very words. Maybe you'll recognize this scripture. His, this is Jesus' words once again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if we take that at face value, if you don't believe in him, what's going to happen? Perish. Going to perish. Right? If you do believe, then you don't perish. And so we had this awesome example of, in the chapter of King Agrippa, right? This great king. You can imagine. You imagine this guy probably has a couple guys fanning him. And when he probably goes to the bathroom, he's not going to wipe himself. And if someone else do that, you know what I mean? It's, it's, he's, it doesn't matter who you think you are. It doesn't. The Bible's clear. It doesn't matter if you think you're King Agrippa, you're the great king. It doesn't matter what your title is, okay? It doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're smart or, I'll be nice, less than smart. Is that nice enough? Okay, it doesn't matter if you're smart or you're less than smart. Okay, without Jesus, you will perish. And God made it so simple that someone less than smart can easily believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Worked for me. Worked for me. I could believe in it. So, without Jesus, you'll perish, but whosoever will, Whosoever will believe in him will have everlasting life. Is that you? Is that you? Are you whosoever will? Are you out there at YouTube? Are you whosoever will? One more thing. I told you it didn't matter who you thought you were, right? It doesn't, this doesn't matter as well, okay? People will get real tied up with this now, especially in the day we live in. It doesn't matter where you think we are in history, Okay? Or when the end of the world will come. Is this the end of the world? Is COVID the end of the world? Is so and so the Antichrist? On and on and on. It, none of that. It doesn't matter. I mean, if it is, it is, right? That's one of the things I like to say. It is what it is. <laughs> what am I going to do to change it? Okay? <clears throat> Maybe COVID has been a wake up call. But whether it's COVID or vaccines or whatever, there's a fact I'm going to tell you right now, and you're going to think I'm being negative, but I'm just pointing out the obvious. You are closer to your death than ever before, right now. Right now, today, this minute, even if you're watching this two years from now, whatever, okay? You're closer to your death right now than you ever have been before. The time is running out. Okay, time's running out. God's made you an offer, and he demands an answer. Did you know that? God demands an answer. He does. He's not going to answer it for you. And if you keep putting him off, it means you've turned down his offer. I'll get around to that. 
I don't know about all that. I, I, I'm not ready for that. Have you ever heard that one? I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for that guy. I, yeah, I've heard about Jesus. I'm just not ready for that. That means you turn down the offer. Don't do that. Don't, don't turn down God's offer. How many times you get an offer like that? Think about it. So this is this, I'll reiterate this. Remember, God loved you enough to give his son for you to die for your sin, and if you will believe in that, you won't perish. Now, man, that's an offer. Oh, no, you're not going to perish. Far from it. You're going to have life everlasting. How about that? How about that for an offer? You want life everlasting? Nah, no think so. It's not that great to begin with. You know, I, don't know. I don't know how you answer that. I don't know how you say no to that. When I heard that offer, and it really clicked into my, my head, I said, sold. You see what I mean? You make me an offer like that, I said, sold. I'm on. I'm in. Whatever it takes, I'll take it. My mama didn't raise no fool. Amen. <laughs> I said, sold. I, yeah, I want that. Give me that one. When you're handing out the offers, I'll take it. Come on. You don't turn down an offer like that. How many times, I ask, how many times you get an offer like that? Once. That's a once-in-a-lifetime offer. Some, you might go and go to buy a new car or something, and the salesman might come out with his big pitch, and he might say, it's a once-in-a-lifetime deal, and slap you on the back, and, eh, there'll be better deals. Go down to the next dealer, and he'll tell you the same thing, okay? But I'm not, I'm not a car salesman. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm telling you what God has offered you, and it's a once-in-a-lifetime offer. And when you die, if you haven't accepted this offer, it's over. You miss out on the deal. And what happens? You perish. Who wants to perish? Raise your hand. Okay, for all those on YouTube, I got no takers. None. None want to perish. Don't put it off any longer. You know, you can be resurrected today from the dead. This resurrection we've talked about where Paul talked about the resurrection of the dead. If it doesn't happen, Christ not be risen and all that. All that wordy stuff from Paul, all equals to you can be resurrected from the dead today. The Lord Jesus Christ, can, you can be born again. Your spirit can come alive. That which was dead can be risen again. And all old things can pass away and everything can be new. Oh, that means I'll live, have a life full of roses and I'll never sin again. Nope. That's not what it means. It means you will now be empowered by the Holy Spirit to guide you through this life, to help you when you make mistakes, to give you a peace that passes all understanding. So when it's over, you know what's going to happen. And it's our job of those who believe this and those who have maybe tired of me talking about the resurrection to share that with other people. Maybe I'm going to say it so much and you're going to get so tired of it that you're going to finally say it to someone else just to get it off your chest. I got to tell you this because I've been hearing it for weeks. You can be resurrected from the dead now if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe they'll look at you, well, in the next chapter we're going to see how Festus is somewhat taken back by this whole, no whole notion. But that's for next week. Next week is chapter 26. Stand. Let's dismiss its time. If you turn down God's offer, it's just like when you don't read your Bible, you've done it to yourself. God didn't do it to you. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn it. It was already condemned. He came into the world so that you could be saved. Amen. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we, we, we come to you now. And we, we thank you so much for preserving your word to us in such a way where we can read it and understand it and we can hear from you and know that it's true. We can receive, and then we can point these things out to other people, Father. 
I pray that you have manifested yourself as real to everyone in the sound of my voice today. That they just know that you are real beyond any shadow of a doubt. And that they feel compelled to share your realness with the people they come into contact with, Father. Because they know Jesus saves. And without him, all will perish. Make that a reality in our lives today, Father. I pray for anyone who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have impressed upon them this day to believe on him as their personal Savior. So now, Father, I pray that you bless, bless these people with every spiritual blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that, that God would comfort you this week. If you need comfort, I pray that he would speak to you when you need spoken to. I pray that the Lord would make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, that he would bless you as you go out these doors and bless you as you go into the places you go this week and every place that you find yourself interacting with people, that God would make you a blessing to them as he's blessing you. In Jesus' name, amen.